Hello, and welcome to Breaking It All Down. I'm Count Zero. Well, way back when I started doing book reviews, I got started with a review of the first book in David Edding's series, The Alenium. Well, I have now come to that trilogy's conclusion with The Sapphire Rose. Oh, that's one else ongoing series that I've gotten started down. Um, how many do I have left? Ah, good. That's perfectly manageable. Let's get started with the review. Previously in the Illunium, Sparhawk, member of the Holy Order of Pandian Knights, has returned home to the kingdom of Samuria from exile only to discover that his queen, Ehlana, has been poisoned and only lives through being placed magically in stasis and protected by a magic diamond shell. Meanwhile, Primate Aeneas is taking advantage of this opportunity to claim control of the Aline Church, first by consolidating control of the various holy orders of knights behind the Order of the Church Knights, which he controls, and second, by putting Lechius, Ilana's bastard brother and the child of an incestuous union of, of the king and his sister, on the throne. As Aeneas' puppet king, he can use the purse of the crown to bankroll Aeneas's bid for the title of Archprelate, leader of the Alien Church. The only way to cure Ilana is to find a magical gemstone called the Bellum. The stone possesses great magical power, almost equal to that of the gods themselves. However, the gemstone is also sought by a dwarf troll named Querig, who pulled the stone out of the earth in ages past and formed it into its current shape. Querig has been seeking the stone after it was taken from him long time ago. Guiding Sparhawk on this journey is Seferina, the steric magical advisor to the Pandian Knights, who is far, far older than she appears. Also guiding him on this journey is Flute, a young, mysterious steric girl who was be revealed by the end of the second book to be the physical incarnation and avatar of the steric child goddess Afrio. Also accompanying Sparhawk on his quest is a group of fellow knights of various orders, notably Sir Uloth, Sir Barret, Sir Bevier, Sir Calton, and Sir Tinian. Okay, technically the Tinian bit of your thing doesn't quite fit, but most of Sparhawk's other companions map fairly well to the Knights of the Round Table. The party is also rounded out with Sparhawk's squire, Kurik, and Kurik's bastard son, Talon, who Kurik didn't really know about, and who is a member of the Sumerian Thieves' Guild. Also along the way, the party is assisted by the heads of two Thieves' Guild, the Time of Sumuria and Stregen of Talesia. These groups are also opposed by the rogue Pandian knight Martell, who is in turn working for a far, far more sinister power. Otha, ruler of the Dark Empire of Zemosh, and servant of the Dark God Azash. This group of knights traveled forth to seek the Holy Grail, or er, um, the Bellum, and at the end of the second book, Sparhawk finally obtained it. The knights quickly, very, very quickly, returned to Sumuria, like, in two chapters quickly, Storm the castle, defeating any of the church knights in their way, and cure Elana, also imprisoning Lechius and his mother along the way. At this point, Sparhawk learns that Elana, who he hasn't seen since she was a child, is madly in love with him and will do anything in her power to marry him, in spite of him basically being old enough to be her father. No, really. Sparhawk's pushing for... No, start over. No, really. Sparhawk's pushing 50. And they've also previously established that Sparhawk has mentored, or had mentored, um, Queen Helena when she was a young child. And that, well, I really I understand that in the Middle Ages, marriages were earlier for women. But those marriages were also arranged. Having Elana desperately trying to get in the 
pants of a guy who's old enough to be your dad? <laughs> now with Ilana cured, next comes the matter of stopping Aeneas from claiming the not papacy. So while they're away to keep the church knights from retaking the city, they're, they come up with the idea of having a basically peasant militia uh, secure the city's walls and keep the church knights out. This group would be led by Strajan and Potime, and in the meantime, our knights of the not round table, or rather, no table, because they don't have a table, head out for Demos, the center of the Alenian faith, and at the center of which is the holy city. There, the story moves into a whole bunch of political maneuvering, wheeling, and dealing as Barhawk and his allies try to secure the votes to keep, pap to keep the papacy secure from Aeneas. However, the politicking is interrupted by a attacking force of barbarians led by Martel, who have also sprung Lycius and his mother from the monastery where they were imprisoned. This leads to a long siege, eventually broken by the king of Talesia, Wargan, and a little help from Afriel letting him know that he needs to come to the rescue. Now, the siege and political sections of this are both very well done, but the political portion is particularly notable, noticeable, because David Eddings does a really good job of making the political behind-the-scenes maneuverings interesting and exciting, and also interesting to read, which is something that even better writers or more highly regarded writers have problems with. Looking at you, Tolkien. The final act of the series has Sparhawk and his companions making their way through not Mordor, the land of Zemosh, to Ulthas' capital, where Sparhawk can de destroy Azash once and for all. And it's at this section of the story where Kurik signs his death warrant. In particular, we get a piece of dialogue from him, which I'm not going to quote verbatim, where he specifically says, one, he is nearing his retirement. Two, his pension will include a plot of land which he intends to farm. Three, he wishes to spend more time with his wife and particularly his young children. Thus giving us the he's gonna die hat trick. So, yeah, Kurik dies later in the story in Oda's temple fighting one of Martel's, heavy, Martel's heavies. Again, I don't feel bad about spoiling, spoiling this because as soon as you get the hat trick handed down here, it's like, oh... He's going to die. And consequently, all impact of his death is lost. And yes, you can't grow to know and like this character over the course of the book, but there comes a point in storytelling where when you, for lack of a better term, that's what foreshadow the character's death too much, but when you blatantly state this character is a dead man walking too much, when it happens... You don't. You lose the impact. I mean, the only the only one really one case where I've seen a work of fiction that got around this, and I don't want to spoil. I'm not sure if I want to spoil it because it. On the one hand, it's actually been spoiled very well, very well if you know anything about the series. But on the other hand. If you haven't seen it, I don't want to ruin the impact for you. So, I'll say the name of the series, and then give you like five seconds, and then spoil it. The series is Full Metal Alchemist. If you haven't seen it, skip ahead... Oh, I don't know. Uh, five minutes. And then, five minutes or less, and then I'll... Yeah. So, in Full Metal Alchemist, there is a character <clears throat> who is regularly depicted as showing off his showing off pictures of his newborn child. And he often is, is in situations where things are very dangerous and there's a distinct possibility that he could die. So consequently we think He's going to die. We expect for the character to be killed. We expect him to die much earlier in the story because he keeps flashing around the friggin' picture. Like, oh, this time this character is going to die. No, this time this character is going to die. Hmm. Maybe this time he's going to die. Going to die. And eventually, it gets to the point where we where we start thinking, oh, the creator is going to undermine this trope and 
subvert it. Say, no, we're going to have this character keep flashing this, so you keep expecting him to be killed, because he keeps talking about his kid, he keeps talking about how cute his kid is, and he keeps showing his picture of his kid, and eventually, and, but yet he, he doesn't die, and he'll, he'll completely survive the series, thus messing with our expectations, what we've been trained to expect from watching all sorts of war movies and cop movies and all this sort of things. It'd be like having the character talking about being uh, a week away from retirement and surviving the movie. Um character talking about buying a farm and actually living to farm on the farm. We, we expect them to not get to see or get to do or enjoy what they've been talking about wanting to enjoy. And Full Metal Alchemist ex does this so much that we expect, okay, it's going to be the subver subversion now, which means when this character does die, it has the emotional impact that it should have had in the first place if they just killed him right off the bat. It's, it, it manages to subvert and basically, and avert all of the trained emotional responses that we get from years of watching war movies, cop movies, um, all sorts of stuff. And that's great. It's an excellent piece of writing. And unfortunately, the Elenium doesn't do that. The Elenium doesn't go with that good piece of writing. Or rather, they don't... David Eddings doesn't have the sense to subvert our expectations for proving them right in the first place and making us sad for not doing it. I mean, we introduced the kids earlier in the story, in book one, but by the time we got to here, I'd forgotten about the, him being near retirement. By the time we got to here, I'd forgotten about the farm, or the the, the land that was his, um, that was his pension that he was going to farm. For this to work, for that subversion into a played straight kind of, you would have to basically, well, you have to to keep going with it. You have to do what Full Metal Alchemist does, and keep hammering it home so that we expect him to die to such a degree that when he doesn't, we assume he's not going to. Thus allowing us to have the emotional impact that we should get when this character dies normally. Either that or not bring that up at all, not bring up the farm, not bring up the retirement, not bring up the... Um, the spending more time with his wife and the young child and that sort of thing. That's the, the other real op other option there is, is if you if you're not planning to subvert it anymore and you're not a cop movie, don't bring up those tropes. But otherwise, when they come up, rather than foreshadowing a character death or or twisting the knife at their death, it actually lessens it. Because we expect it. We have a degree of, oh, he's going to die, isn't he? That's unfortunate. And then he dies. We aren't all boo-hoo-hoo. -hoo. It's mild sadness. I guess the best way of putting it. So the book also has a plot thread, which I'm not too fond of, that's introduced in this book. Like, at the very end of this book. It sets up that instead of Sparhawk just merely being that badass, he is... The Chosen One. He is the Ananka. A-N-A-K-H-A. If that's not how it's pronounced, somebody please post the phonetic pronunciation in the comments. Um, he is someone who has no destiny, and thus someone whose actions the gods cannot predict, making him a wild card in cosmic affairs. This revelation comes completely out of the blue, and I really don't know what to think about it. What I liked about Sparhawk, all the way back in book one, is he's not the chosen one. He's not the lowly farm boy who is sent to advent to great adventures. He doesn't need to have the call to adventure come knocking at the door. He's already proved himself a hero. It's 
we don't need to go through the Joseph Campbell monomyth for this character, even though we might be taking elements from certain from other stories which follow the monomyth structure. It's not needed. Um, but by dumping this chosen one bit all the way at the end and making him the foretold hero who was outside destiny and so forth, it actually gets him locked in a sense of, dest uh, of, of destiny. Because we as the, because we, once we discover that, oh, he is the chosen one, we as the audience now, okay, he has to succeed. There's no tension now. You can't say, oh, there's a chance he can fail. No, you already said he's the chosen one. He is the destined one to be outside, destined man outside destiny. He is the wild card in the affairs of gods. Which basically means, from a narrative standpoint, he's the all-time winner. What can you do? As an audience, to try and build tension. It becomes a case of less will they succeed and more how will they succeed. And in some cases, not even that. At this point, they've already described leading up to this before the big reveal how, he's go how he has to do it. Okay, Here's how you use the MacGuffin to destroy the big bat. That's already been explained. So we know how he's going to do it. The question up until the reveal is Will he do it? Will he be able to do it? And as soon as they say, oh, and by the way, he's the chosen one, well, of course he's going to do it. I have no longer have any emotional investment in this last portion of the story. Unless they're going to have him somehow be killed in the process, there's nothing here for me to worry about. I have no tension. I mean, they've already killed off the... They've already killed off one member of the party... Theoretically, they could kill off other members, except the way you normally do that is you do a Ten Little Indians thing, or um, and then there were none thing, where you have characters picked off one at a time. And it doesn't do that either. The number of people who make it to the end are, as far as make it, make it to the final battle and witness Sparhawk succeed all come out alive. It's... It's unfortunate. It's a definite case of the author kind of sabotaging himself. So the story concludes with our heroes returning home in triumph. Barhawk and Helana get married. Well, they've been married before. Maybe before he left, but now they're Prince and Queen, Prince Consort and Queen, I don't know what the job title is for Sparhawk. Um, and then Afriel reincarnates herself as the child of Sparhawk and Alana because the poison that required Alana to be put in the magical coma also rendered her infertile. So now Sparhawk has a goddess as a daughter. Yeah. Still, this would all make for a somewhat satisfying conclusion to the story. Everyone lives happily ever after, so forth and so on. But then the book wraps itself up by telling us to look forward to the next trilogy involving these characters, the Tamuli. And I read this after I finished the book. I'm like, huh. This must not be the first printing. This must not be the first edition. Because this undermines the ending. This is a happily ever after ending you've given me here. And by sticking this tune in next time, like, oh, this guy was already planning the next trilogy by the time he wrote this. And he wasn't actually planning giving these guys any actual narrative closure. So that this would be something that the publisher is stuck in for <clears throat> a future edition or future printing to hype up the audience for the next series. So I went and I looked at the front cover to test my my little hypothesis. Cause it's, it's testable, it's verifiable, or false, well, testable and falsifiable. I look at the front cover and the, the inset with all the publishing information, and lo and behold, this is the first printing. This bugs me for no good reason. It's a totally a personal thing. 
putting this blatant tune in next time at the end of a book like this undermines your ending. It basically, if you have even you have a satisfying ending, dumping on there the it's like tacking a question mark at the end of the the at the the end card at the end of the movie. Because what it says is, yeah, our heroes have achieved a great victory, but we made a lot of money making this, so we're going to do another one just for the hell of it. And I, I can understand having this sort of moment of victory with the shadow of, of additional problems on the horizon thing in something like a comic book in, in a shared universe like superhero comics or um, the Thieves World series of books, something like that, because it's a shared universe. Other people are going to play with these characters. I have that expectation that that is how this thing works coming in. When a work of fantasy fiction does this, when a book series, probably one that's built as a trilogy and which finishes, does this, then I get a little, a little annoyed. It's like, um, you had a really good, a perfectly good ending here. Why'd you throw it away? Uh, not that I'm saying you can't do sequels. If a writer wants to do more sequels after they finish their trilogy or whatever, more power to them. It's just, when you have a planned ending, when you have, when you've written your ending, it fits, everything makes sense, there's closure, Sticking on there a tune in next time, particularly when the new series isn't even out yet, undermines it and hurts it, is what I'm trying to say. And so unless it was a publisher's mandate thing, unless it was a case of after the book was finished, um, David Eddings filled out, uh, signed a contract for another trilogy in the universe um, with his publisher, and they stuck that on there without his permission... I forgive that. If this was a case of when David Eddings um, signed the contract or whatever, um, signed the publishing deal for the Elenium, it was actually for two trilogies. I'll give a little wiggle room, I guess. It just kind of bugs me. Kind of, it bugs me. It bugs me for unnecessary, gratuitous, no good reasons, but they're still there. So, I may eventually vi visit and review the Tamuli, but that's a later thing. In the meantime, I finished up a video game recently, and for my next review, I want to give my thoughts on that. Until then, if you enjoy this review, please give it a thumbs up, and subscribe to my YouTube channel. I also appreciate any feedback you'd like to offer in the comments, and I'd like to thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time. Thank <laughs> you.